and welcome to Philosophical Foundations and Spiritual Formation. I'm going to be your professor, Joe Bankard. Um, to my knowledge, this is the one and only philosophy class that you'll be taking in this program, and I apologize for that. I know that not all of you are very keen or excited to um, take philosophy. My Part of my job, and part of this sort of introduction to the class, is uh, to get you more excited. So we're going to do a few things um, in this first video. One of them is I'm just going to sort of introduce you to myself. Uh, I want you to get a sense of who I am. I want you to start feeling comfortable with me. Um, online education can be tough if you don't feel comfortable with your professor. I want you to be able to call, email, um, Skype, whatever it is. If you need help, I want you to feel comfortable to contact me. So, a little bit about myself. Number one, um, this is my fifth year teaching at Northwest Nazarene University, and I love it here. I have a great school of theology and a great department. I work in the philosophy department, which is sort of housed under the school of theology. The faculty here are wonderful and students. So this is my fifth year. I graduated from Point Loma um, in 1998. So I was there from 94 to 98. I graduated with a BA in philosophy. I then went and got a master's at San Diego State um, and then eventually finished my PhD at Claremont uh, Graduate University, which is up in the LA area, uh, and that was in philosophy of religion. Um, I was fortunate enough in a very difficult job market to get a job here at NNU. Part of it is that um, being a Point Loma grad and I adjuncted down at Point Loma for a while, um, you know, there was some cross mingling and so I knew some people that were up here um, and it has been a pleasure. So that's part of sort of my educational background. Um, I'm married. I've been married for 12 years. Uh, we recently celebrated our 12th anniversary. So that was amazing. My wife's name is Kelly. She also graduated from Point Loma. She got a master's in social work and was a school social worker for several years and um, until we had our first child. We have one son his name is Sullivan. He's three, cute as a button, um, loves to talk and uh, run around and play superheroes. So when I'm not teaching and doing stuff like this, I'm typically getting uh, tackled by a three-year-old Superman. Um, but that's that's going well. We have a dog uh, that used to be our child. Our dog is 11, and so for about eight years he was the baby. He had the beagle named Maury. Um, if I get a chance, maybe uh, I'll show you some pictures. Um, I actually have some pictures uh, of them around. But uh, he is a, a wonderful little dog that gets into too much trouble because he can smell everything. So he get, gets into the trash, uh, destroys shoes, uh, things of that nature. But overall, pretty cute dog. Um, so that's me. I have a few hobbies, things I enjoy outside of teaching philosophy. I really, really enjoy movies and film. Um, I always like recommendations from students. I typically tell students, you know, I don't need to hear about the most recent Batman film or something. I've probably seen advertisements for that. But there are a lot of movies I just can't see. I have a young son, so I don't get to out to the theater. So, you know, maybe you saw an independent movie or a foreign film or something that really grabbed you or you thought was interesting. I always want recommendations, maybe some of your old favorites that I haven't seen, um, things like that. But I do love film. I've seen some interesting ones recently. So for those of you interested, I recently watched Of Gods and Men which I think is wonderful. It might be one of the most sort of profoundly theological movies I've ever seen. It's a true story about a group of monks um, in an African country that's eluding me now, Albania, I believe, but it's a primarily a Muslim population. And they sort of are this group of Christian monks, you know, ministering to that small town. Um, and then a group of extremists sort of threatens them. And then they have to decide whether they should stay and continue to serve in their calling or if they should even go back to France. Wonderful movie. Uh, I recently saw a documentary uh, called Wasteland, which is wonderful. Um, it's an Argentinian uh, artist who employs people who work in the garbage dumps. They call them pickers. He employs them to pick garbage for him. They bring it to a warehouse and he actually transforms the garbage into these wonderful uh, sort of portraits and then gives all the money back to this community, and it's, it's a really wonderful film. So I've seen some interesting ones recently, but I'd love to hear your suggestions. The other thing that I really enjoy um, 
is film, or other than film is sports. I used to play a little bit, not that well, but um, now I like to watch. So I really love the NFL. I'm in a fantasy football league. I, I like and, uh, Major League Baseball. Those are probably my two favorite. I also follow the NBA to some extent. And even though I live in Boise, I don't really follow college football that much, which gets me into trouble with most of my neighbors. I do root for the Boise State Broncos, but to be honest, I don't really know much about college football. So, so those are my two hobbies. Um, if you have any questions or want to ask me more about that, I mean, I'm always interested to get to know you a little better. Uh, if you want to get to know me a little better, again, give me a call, send me an email. As part of the introduction, I want to talk a little bit about philosophy. This intimidates students at times. It, they're not interested. Uh, it seems like that's, it's just sort of a bunch of sort of uh, dead Greeks, like Plato and Aristotle, who said a lot of weird things about, you know, does this water bottle exist or something? Ah, you know, I don't know, does it? And I want to say that philosophy is really not like that primarily. Um, certainly those questions arise, but for me, philosophy is uh, often much more practical and much more tangible. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. We can look at philosophy in lots of different ways, but um, one of the one of the ways I like to one of the things I like to emphasize when I talk about philosophy, and one of the things that I'm going to emphasize in this class, is that in many respects, philosophy is about evaluating ideas and evaluating arguments. Um, how do we know whether something's a good argument or a bad argument? How do we know that that's a good, supportable opinion or one that's merely speculation? Uh, how do we develop principles of good critical thinking? In some sense, there's a science to philosophy in trying to help us separate the wheat from the chaff, the good arguments from the bad arguments. Because you can't really get away from philosophy. It's everywhere. You cannot escape it. Um, politics, uh, or, you know, that's very relevant these days. But whether people know it or not, politicians have a particular philosophy undergirding their ideas. Um, so a particular view of human nature, as an example. One, um, someone who tends to be more liberal might look at human beings and say that human behavior is not 100% uh, free. Human behavior is often the result of one's environment, how one is raised, the options that one has available to them based on education level and whatnot. This affects so much of human behavior. So if we want to change human behavior, for instance, if we want to lower crime, if we want to uh, lower the unemployment rate and whatnot, well, we need to change the social environment, like poverty, schools, other things. And if we can make those kinds of changes, then we're going to see changes in human behavior. That's a philosophy that then affects a particular economic view. We ought to provide, for instance, because of this, we ought to provide social programs to help people, enable them, uh, give them opportunity, and uh, give them the, the chance they wouldn't have had otherwise to really make those kinds of choices in their lives. Often someone more conservative has a different view of human nature. They focus on human choices and human freedom. And that as long as we live in a country that's free and that isn't dominated by the government, then people have an opportunity to make the right kinds of choices and sort of get themselves out of poverty, right? Crime is not the result of social settings. It's the result of people making selfish, sinful choices. So if we increase punishments, that will deter people into making good kinds of choices. So rather than social programs, maybe we increase punishments or something like that. But the emphasis is more on human freedom and responsibility and less on what caused the person to make those decisions. Two very different philosophies of human nature, but they end up playing out in our economic views. Whether we like it or not, philosophy is there. We can't talk about the law. I mean, if you, if you read any Supreme Court justice decision, what you're going to see is a lot of philosophy, philosophy of the law, philosophy of what it means to be human, a philosophy about human rights. Um, we have lots of examples of this. Uh, for, ex for instance, Often, public safety and my right to privacy come into conflict, and how do I reconcile that? Um, so when I get on a plane, I'm typically willing to sacrifice my right to privacy for public safety. So I'll, I'll go through a metal detector and I'll do other things. In fact, if I don't, I can't get on the plane um, because we feel like public safety overrides a person's right to privacy. So we're going to scan your body for metal and other things. We're going to look through your stuff make sure you're not bringing anything onto the plane. At what point do those conflict in a way that makes us uncomfortable, right? Um, can my phones be tapped without cause? 
for public safety, right? This was part of the Patriot Act. If there's someone, if there's a, someone suspicious, can we tap their phones without a warrant? Because yes, we're invading privacy, but we're doing this in an attempt to see if this person is dangerous. So if you have a judge with one philosophy versus a judge with a different philosophy, you're going to get a different answer to that question. But it's often this notion of rights and how we dis determine these answers. The way we do that is going to be argumentation. Which ideas and which arguments are strong and supportable and which are weaker? So you can't escape it whether we're talking about politics, we're talking about the law, if you're talking about morality. And I don't care what moral view you have, your moral view is going to have a particular set of values. It's going to have a particular telos, a goal. What, what is behavior aiming at? Right? What are we shooting at with our behavior? Do we hit the mark or miss the mark? We typically understand moral behavior is that which hits the mark we're aiming at, immoral behavior that which misses the mark. Well, if that's the case, then we need to know what the telos is. But that's going to be determined by philosophy. What is the ultimate end of human behavior? What values do we bring with us along the way, etc.? You can't do theology without philosophy. On and on. You can't escape it. So, we're either going to philosophize well, or we're going to philosophize poorly. Part of this course is trying to create criteria to help us evaluate arguments. How do I know when someone's making a good argument from a bad one? And then, of course, I'm going to be asking you to make your own arguments. What do you think, and more importantly, why you're going to defend that? In your defense, you're going to be using principles of philosophy, right? principles of argumentation. So I hope that makes philosophy less intimidating for you. It's not a bunch of lofty conversations that are beyond your scope. It really is saying, OK. If we're going to talk about human nature, let's look at a set of ideas and evaluate which ones we think have evidence and are strong and are coherent and consistent, and which ones fall apart. If we're talking about ethics, which answers are clear, comprehensive, again, have data supporting them, fit our view of human nature, which of them seem incompatible and weakly supported. We're going to be doing this throughout. Um, to lay my own cards on the table a little bit, um, I, I'm someone who's typically skeptical of those who, when we're talking about large issues like theology and morality and whatnot, I'm skeptical of those that think that there is just one clear right answer, one clear objective black and white truth. Um, typically, things are complicated when we get to those lofty sorts of discussions. And even if we have the Bible at our disposal, which we do, we have Christians who read the same Bible and yet disagree with one another. And at some point, it becomes very difficult to know, OK, well, this clear person's clearly right, and this person's clearly wrong. Um, at the same time, I'm also not an extreme relativist. I'm not someone who thinks all ideas are equal. All arguments are equal. I'm not someone who thinks everyone's interpretation of scripture is equally valid. So part for philosophy and part for me is about saying, OK, we've got this marketplace of ideas. We're going to apply certain criteria. We're going to be able to say, you know what? These interpretations are clearly inconsistent, clearly scripture plucking. These moral views clearly lead to negative fruit down the line. These right political views seem to have certain conflicts within them. And that's going to leave us with a set of decent to good arguments or ideas. Now we've got something to work with. Now we're sort of down the right road. So I often think of truth not as something I know or possess that I have the perfect right answer to, but a journey. It's something I pursue. Every day I wake up and say, I want to pursue truth. I want to use philosophical tools to pursue truth. I want to read scripture and pray, and I want to pursue God. But at no point will I say, hmm, now I know God fully. I know all the inner workings of the divine mind. I know which creeds are true and which one's false. I've got this clear black and white objective view right, of God. Clearly, God will always be more than I can comprehend. God will always be beyond what I can understand. So that means I have to spend my life doing the work, waking up each day on this journey saying, I want to know you more, Lord. I want to pursue you more. Well, if we think there's a relationship between God and truth, my pursuit of truth will be no different. At no point will I say, I know all of the truth. I have this clear black and white answer. 
But I'm also not going to say, well, truth is whatever I want it to be. Clearly, that's not the case either. If that were true, then I could fly, I'd be a millionaire, and uh, I'd look like Tom Cruise, right? But I don't. So it seems like truth is not something I can control, but it is something I can pursue and spend my life waking up each day saying, I want to know more of the truth, more than I knew yesterday. So hopefully part of the tools we learn in this class is to say, this is how philosophers pursue truth diligently. We're often not relativists, at least I'm not. I'm also not, at least in most cases, I'm not an absolutist, but instead I see it as a lifelong journey that says, I'm going to get closer to the truth, and when I'm dead, I'll be closer than where I am right now. That I'm going to start, I'm on the right path, the right journey, right? Asking the right kinds of questions. So that's sort of how I understand philosophy, at least as it relates to this class. And now I, I want to talk a little bit about of the course that you're going to be taking, this, this eight-week journey. We're going to do one, the first week, week one, is going to introduce you to some of these ideas, introduce you to forms of argumentation, introduce you to the criteria that philosophers often implement to evaluate ideas, um, and it's going to sort of give you some introduction to terminology. After uh, week two, we're going to spend a couple of weeks reading a text that's a wonderful book. Um, by Kevin Corcoran, Rethinking Human Nature. Um, and he's going to talk about what it means to be human. If we're going to talk about spiritual formation, right? this is your what your graduate degree is in, then we need to know what it means to be human. So the common view is that, right, a dualistic one, human beings, at least in the Christian tradition, human beings have a body and we also have a soul. Dual means two, body, soul. So Kevin Corcoran is going to sort of look at different dualistic views of the human person. He's also going to explore some materialistic alternatives, those that say we are nothing more than atoms and cells. The only thing that exists is matter, essentially, that which is physical. And he's going to sort of contrast these views against one another. In the end, he's going to argue for a third alternative, a third view of human nature. He's a Christian philosopher, and he's going to argue that this third alternative is compatible with Scripture, compatible with Orthodox Christianity. He, he thinks it resolves some of the problems that arise because of the other two. I actually like his argument, and I think it's interesting, so we're going to sort of be grappling with that. After that, so that'll be weeks two and three, after that we're going to move into talking about what it means to have character a virtuous character specifically, and we're going to look at character development. We're going to be reading a book by Aristotle called Nakamikian Ethics. In this text, Aristotle is going to sort of give us the nuts and bolts of how to develop certain virtuous character traits, how to pursue this ultimate telos, which for him is sort of human flourishing. The connection um, between Aristotle and this notion of like this debate between dualism and materialism is that I think too often we look at spiritual formation and we think, well, spiritual formation is different than character formation. Spiritual formation is different than moral formation. Spiritual formation is about my spirit, my soul. So I need to pray and um, I've got to make sure to read my Bible and do a lot of things that make me feel sort of holy in my isolated sense where I'm doing my own devotions and I, I'm, I'm in tune with God. But I think that's a mistake. I don't, I would argue you cannot separate spiritual formation from character formation or moral formation. What I do with my life, with my body, with my, what I say, how I treat people, that is what my spirit does and thinks and says. When I develop my character, I am developing my spirit that the two cannot be easily separated from, from each other. So spiritual formation, in many sense, is about developing a particular kind of character, becoming a particular kind of person, because as one is molded, so too is the other. So when Aristotle talks about character formation, I think in many respects, he's giving us some really good insights into spiritual formation. So that's week four. Week five and week six, we're going to read an excellent book by N.T. Wright called After You Believe. And this text is going to look at what Aristotle gave us and essentially put it into a Christian framework. Aristotle's not a Christian, he's Greek, you call him pagan. Uh, I think he gives us some wonderful insight, but it's not Christian. Well, why? 
I think N.T. Wright does a great job of saying, here are the nuggets of truth that Aristotle gives us. Here are some really good things to take away. And then he says, but it's not quite Christian, yet if we tweak it in certain ways, it, we get a more robust view of what it means to talk about character formation, virtue, and spiritual formation. So N.T. Wright will be this great bridge okay, between, the, between Kevin Corcoran's book about human nature, Aristotle's book about character formation, and then N.T. Wright provides this bridge to Christianity. So I really think that will be interesting. We'll do that weeks five and six. Week seven is going to be a book called Glittering Vices by Rebecca DeYoung. She's also a Christian philosopher, like Kevin Corcoran, and she's going to talk about the seven uh, sort of capital vices. Wonderful little book, very readable. Um, we talk about virtue a lot. Sometimes vice gets neglected. She explains each of the seven vices, gives us some traditional sort of historical context uh, in the Christian tradition, and then does a great job of applying it. How do these vices look in our current 21st century context, and what sorts of habits can we develop that might help fight against some of them? I know that as I read the book, certain vices I thought don't apply to me as much. Others I thought, wow, that's me. That's my vice. And it was really helpful to then say, you know what? Once I identify that, now she's giving me some helpful tools about ways I might overcome that. That'll be week seven. And then in week eight, we will sort of culminate by talking about this notion of morality, virtue, character development, spiritual development. And we're going to sort of look at this in the context of neuroscience. There's a burgeoning field uh, in neuroscience relating it to issues of moral formation and spiritual formation. So we know that when you do something, when you think something, um, certain neural networks are created, certain grooves. The more you do something, the deeper those grooves become, the more entrenched those neural networks become. It's almost like uh, when you sled. The first time you try to go down a snowy hill, your sled only goes a little way, you know, sort of goes a little bit, but the snow is so deep. The next person goes down and it you know, goes to where you stop and goes a little bit further. The next person down that slope a little further. Well, pretty soon after you've gone down 20 times, everyone's zooming down the hill. You know? In fact, if you're at the top and you're sitting on your little toboggan and you're anywhere near where that, you know, that, that sort of path is created, you'll sort of start to move, find yourself moving right towards the hill and going down it, right? Because that's sort of the way things are moving as, it, as you pack down the snow. Our brains are similar. You do something once, fine, twice, 10 times, 20 times, those neural networks are, are getting more deeply entrenched so that your brain will have certain natural responses as a result of these habits. The more I do something, the more natural it becomes for me to do that, according to right, uh, this, this brain processing. So we're going to look at some spiritual disciplines. Uh, the one we'll focus on is prayer and meditation. There's some fascinating research that just demonstrates how the habit of prayer starts to reshape our brain through MRI uh, um, images, how it leads to certain outcomes, more compassion, um, greater levels of concentration, um, heightened sense of feelings, of empathy and whatnot. There's all kinds of things that become more natural for those that actually habitually pray. We will also look at gratitude and a couple of other habits um, and how those shape the brain, but prayer is going to be one of the main ones. And we'll sort of see Aristotle and N.T. Wright and some of this stuff we've been covering through the first seven weeks at work in our brains. It should be exciting. So I hope you're excited. If you have any questions, let me know, but I'm looking forward to getting started. The next thing I would do is I would look at the syllabus video uh, you're going to be able to see my little face in the corner of that and the syllabus document out in front of you and we're going to sort of walk through that together so that you know what's required of you.